What's up, everyone? Gavin Lee Radium here. I know you all have been waiting for this for a long time, and finally, the first part of my China vlog is ready. I'm gonna keep my intro short and get in the main video soon. I promise. So I've wanted to do vlogs for a long time for my Thailand trip in 2017, Japan in 2019, UAE in 2023, and multiple previous journeys to China, but never got to doing them. This is my first time editing a vlog, and I hope you all enjoy. Let's get started. My journey began with a flight from Singapore into China. Before 2020, I traveled to China every year with my family to visit my grandparents and relatives. But because of COVID and NS, my military service, I was unable to travel overseas until the summer of 2023, when we had a family trip to the UAE. Here I am in Changi Airport again, finally going back to China for the first time in almost four years. Usually, we would fly to Beijing from Singapore because most of my relatives live in northern and northeast China, and my grandparents live in the capital city Beijing itself. But this time, I'm going to the city. I never been to before, Chengdu, and I'm flying alone to meet with friends from high school whose hometown is Chengdu. They invited me to spend a few days in their home city, and here I was on my flight via Singapore Airlines from Singapore Changi Airport to Chengdu Tianfu International Airport. Although the flight felt like an air courier instead. <laughs> The original plane had a fault, and we had to be reassigned a plane that has no entertainment system installed. But hey, at least the food was decent enough. And here you see me doing a Lou review, stealing no filler job. <laughs> Pretty basic Singapore Airlines economy class lavatory. Nothing too special here, considering the fact that the plane was literally an air courier. A few hours later, I arrive at Chengdu Tianfu International Airport. The moment the plane touched down was the moment I returned to China for the first time in almost four years. <laughs> Sorry, no plane landing video footage, cause I wasn't sitting at the window seat, smiling face with tear. Anyways, Chengdu is the third city in China to have a second airport after Beijing and Shanghai. So with the second airport, it shows that Chengdu has a lot of air traffic passing through and can be regarded as the major transport hub in southwestern China. So it's also the second largest airport in the world after only the King Fahd International Airport in Damam, Saudi Arabia. Okay, info section over. Back to the main video. Arriving in Chengdu Tianfu Airport, I was immediately awed by the interior design and also super excited that I'm finally back. In China, I mean, I had seen many foreign travelers make vlogs about the new fancy airports in China, but it was my first time seeing the inside of Chengdu Tianfu Airport for myself. Anyways, I landed, went through the standard airport international arrival procedure, and met up with my friends. Then they drove me from the airport to the city. Yup, Tianfu Airport is relatively further away from Chengdu metropolitan area, but it's still at least located administratively inside Chengdu, unlike Luton Airport, which isn't even located within Greater London. It's at this point I actually noticed I don't have a lot of video footage. I just have a lot of pictures and a script to read from, which will result in me yapping nonstop, and you'll get bored and tired of my voice. Rookie mistake. That's my bad on、uh, not sufficiently preparing for making a proper vlog. But hey, at least this is an attempt. So after arriving in the city and checking into my hotel. We went out to walk around a few places in the city, passing by the Sichuan Conservatory of Music, Sichuan Yue Xue Yuan, located on a street with many music shops selling pianos that I can only dream of seeing in Singapore. Then passed by this bridge on the river, very pretty, very beautiful late afternoon view. It was then dinner time, where we went to eat at a restaurant called Tao De Clay Pot. Where we ate authentic Sichuan food, so a lot of people who have heard about Sichuan pepper would think, yeah, Sichuan food is gonna be pretty spicy, and I thought so too. I usually don't eat spicy food, as I have low spice tolerance for a Chinese. <laughs> yeah, but in fact, the majority of Sichuan food is actually not spicy. And my experience from Chengdu tells me that if someone from Chengdu says something isn't spicy, it really isn't spicy. And I really enjoyed this soy milk-like vitamin E drink, Wei Yi. That's only sold in Sichuan, nowhere else in China. So we had dinner with a third friend, went out into the city center together, visited some gift shops and bookstores, then into the Tai Gu Li along Chunxi Lu. This place is the financial center of Chengdu City, and there's literally a building called the IFS, Chengdu International Finance Square, with a panda ass hanging from the top of the building. <laughs> So we went inside the building, met Mario, 
made our way up to the panda and I took a few pics from a distance because people were literally queuing to take a close up selfie with the panda. Then we wandered around the rooftop garden. Yes, a lot of buildings in tiny cities now have green roofs with plants and spaces for people to relax. After that, we went back out into the street and passed by a 3D advertisement board with a huge panda about to pop out of it. And a Gucci store with very traditional Chinese architectural style bricks. Yeah. So going through the pedestrian streets, we came across Da Ci Si, a Buddhist temple that would look even better during the day. After this, we went to Kuan Zhai Xiangzi. This name literally means the wide and narrow alley. So this is more a, tra a more traditional area in Chengdu with tea houses and mini museums. But can this place attract tourists if it doesn't have panda merch shops? I mean, this is Chengdu, the city with the most number of pandas per capita. So what kind of panda merch doesn't this city have? Oh, and other than pandas, rabbits are also pretty popular here as a food. But I had a taste of a free sample of rabbit meat. Didn't particularly enjoy it nor hate it, it just tasted uh, average to me. Nothing too special. Guess it's personal preference and taste, eh? My friends accompanied me back to my hotel on the metro, and I got a rant here. Metro prices in Chengdu are so cheap. In all of China, actually. So much cheaper than in Singapore. That's what metro should be for the general public, the working and student population especially. I don't have any metro pics or videos from day one, but heck, the metro is dope! My friends treated me to a midnight snack bill and bought me a mini baked egg cake with beef fillings before I went back to my hotel room. To make up for the lack of video footage from day one, here's a tour of my hotel room. The room... Very small, very cozy. You could once see the toilet from here. And yeah. my second day in Chengdu, just a simple little bun for breakfast, and I'm going to take the train out of the city with my two friends. First, I'm meeting them at the Xipu High Speed Railway Station, which I have to take the metro to reach. So, here, some Chengdu metro video. Xipu station is an integrated station for both metro and high-speed intercity trains. Like, the high-speed train platform is right across the partition from the metro platform. But I have to exit the metro station and make one huge round outside the station, then go into the intercity train station, go through a security check and separate ticket check to reach the intercity train platform. Still, China's high-speed trains never fail to impress and amaze me, and they'll actually be my main mode of intercity travel during the majority of my entire one-month-long trip in China. So, train arrived in Dujiangyan city. Technically, Dujiangyan is administratively part of Chengdu, but not part of the metropolitan central city of Chengdu. Trying to think about it like Greater London encompassing areas that surrounding London city, but not part of the metropolitan area of London city. Similarly, Chengdu is a prefecture level city that encompasses the metropolitan central district that make up Chengdu city, as well as other smaller county level cities like Dujiangyan and Jianyang, where Tianfu Airport is located. So why are we in Dujiangyan? Well, remember I mentioned Chengdu is the city with the most number of pandas per capita in the world? Here in Dujiangyan, by the mountainous forest and away from the human polluted city area, there's a nature reserve called the Panda Cove, Xiumaogu, and we came here to see pandas! <laughs> Hold up, that's not a panda. <laughs> what are you afraid of?
Nah, Black Swan hadn't been released yet. It was December 2023, Lamal. Anyways, the pandas here are so lazy that they just plop their MB philosophers. Sometimes I wonder why they switch from eating meat like other their other bear cousins to chomping on bamboo. Were their ancestors also this lazy and rolling around and sitting thinking of philosophical questions when they're not sleeping? Probably. They're also very cute. I managed to see their paw. Other than big, huge, giant pandas in black and white, I also saw some small red pandas. They share the same habitat as their big monochrome cousins. Uh, wait, no. They're actually not related. Red pandas are their own breed while giant pandas are bears. But in English terms, for some reason, red pandas and giant pandas are both named pandas. And in Chinese, they're also both called xiong mao, meaning bear cat. Giant panda, da xiong mao, big bear cat. Red panda, xiao xiong mao, small bear cat. Red pandas are much more active and less lazy, and also cuter. They pull up and also expose their adorable, twitchy little paws. Although, I didn't see a red panda stand up during my visit. Eh. But here, just enjoy some videos of these cute little fluffy creatures. They're really just cats. Last but not least, the merch shop on the way out. Take a look at these uh, red panda scarves. This fluffy panda football. Panda itself. Panda and bamboo scarf. These panda nunchucks that I have no idea how to use because I'm not Asian, I'm Afshin. And the panda wearing a red panda suit. But in the end, I just got myself this one panda that I'm putting here and you can take all the time in the world to enjoy and admire here. After lunch with my friends at this pretty traditional looking place, we head over to the mountain to visit the structure that gave the city of Dujiangyan its name, the Dujiangyan Irrigation System. It was first constructed by the state of Qin in the year 256 BC, decades before the first unified dynasty of China, on the Mian River, Mianjiang. This river separates the Chengdu Plain from the Qinghai Tibet Plateau of western Sichuan. The name Dujiangyan literally means Du for Chengdu, Jiang for the Mian River, Mianjiang, and Yan meaning weir or low head dam in English. So, Du Jiang Yan literally means the dam on the Mian River in Chengdu. With this place history dating back to even before the first unification of China, it became a UNESCO heritage site. It's super impressive feat that it was constructed by engineers almost 2300 years ago. Up here, it was really windy and significantly colder. So my friend here, a Chengdu native, didn't wear enough clothes to keep warm and became a villager. While I, a northerner whose natural habitat is the snowy winterland, simply enjoyed a green bean popsicle as we made our way down to the Anlan suspension bridge, Anlan Suoqiao, connecting the left bank on the east to the island in the middle. I had to use the WC and it was a loo with a view with a meshed window, but even through that, the scenery was breathtaking. The waters looked so rapid, so to get on the bridge, we just passed through this traditional style gate and behold. The scenery here is even more majestic and beyond the description of words. There, to the right is the plain, and to the left is the plateau connecting to the Tibet and the Himalayas, all the way west to Gilgit Baltistan in Pakistan, separated by the very river in front of me. Super majestic view. Following the flow of the river, we walk to Li Dui, which contains the original site of the Qin Kingdom era Dujiangyan irrigation project, which was unfortunately devastated after an earthquake in 1933 during the Republic of China era, but rebuilt. And this flag behind me? No, it isn't the flag of the Communist Party or anything, just because it's red and yellow. It's actually the immortal golden sunbird, Taiyang Shen Niao, a symbol representing Chengdu or the entire Sichuan province dating back to the pre-Central Plains culture ancient Bashu era. A little walk into the Li Dui Park, Li Dui Gongyuan, I took a picture with Zhuge Liang, the Imperial Chancellor or Prime Minister of the city of Shu Han during the Three Kingdoms period. Then this nice looking little, no, big pond. Then this bridge over the Puyang River called South Bridge, 
南桥 Yeah, there are quite a few rivers in China named Puyang, maybe written with different characters with the same pronunciation, and obviously many south bridges. <laughs> Then to this square in front of the Xuanhua Gate, Xuanhua Mun, the gate to the ancient walled town of Guanxian, literally meaning irrigation county, which was the what the entire city of Dujiangyan was called before 1988. So before I left Dujiangyan, I saw a huge lazy panda lying on the grass and taking a selfie. So I did what I had to do, lie beside it and take a selfie too. No, I didn't lie down, but I did take a selfie. <laughs> We went back from Dujiangyan to Chengdu City by train in the late afternoon, starting at Lidui Gongyuan Station and arriving at Xipu. We then took a taxi into the city center where we met with the third friend from the day before at Global Center Huanqiu Zhongxin, which initially seemed to be like a huge. Stadium or something, but nope, it was actually a large shopping complex. I didn't take too many pics or vids inside, but the outside is beautiful as heck. Not only the global center, but also the other buildings illuminating the skies of Chengdu as the day gives into the night. We went to a tea and opera house to watch some of the most famous and eye-opening traditional Sichuan opera, Chuan Ju, which fascinates visitors from other parts of China as well as the entire world. I was so engrossed in their performance that I only took two videos of the stage performance. So there's this live tea pouring where the performer came down from the stage and performed tea pouring tricks for the audience. And the most famous part of Sichuan opera, face changing, 变脸。After watching the opera, we went to have a midnight supper hot pot. It was Chongqing style hot pot and a lot of pepper and even chili. So the difference between Chongqing hot pot and Chengdu style is that Chengdu people will intentionally avoid the spicy additional ingredients, while Chongqing people will simply eat them. Yeah. Also, Chengdu is mainly pepper, while Chongqing is closer to Hubei and Hunan, so they have both pepper and chili. A weird choice to be eating Chongqing hot pot in Chengdu, but I'm not complaining because we've got pig brain here. <laughs> Gonna be my first time tasting an animal's brain, and honestly, it tastes something like fried tofu, and isn't bad at all. Also enjoyed my potato and egg fried rice. By the time we finished eating, it was very very late, but I managed to catch the last train of the day and arrive back to my hotel to rest for the night and prepare for the next day. Third day in Chengdu, I wake up and it's already daytime, and the temperature outside has dropped significantly. We quickly took the bus to our destination for today, the Wuhou Shrine, Wuhou Ci. On my way from the bus stop to the entrance of the shrine, I passed by a lot of Tibetan shops. So my dad actually warned me about the streets of Tibetan-owned shops in Chengdu, saying that he had friends who got scammed or forced by their merch. Luckily, I wasn't the victim of any of those. So the shop owners who saw me pass by, as well as other people pass by, were pretty chill. None of them forced me to buy their things at their shop, and they mostly just greeted me good morning and asked if I wanted to take a look at their stuff. I just shook my head or waved my hand, saying no, and that's it. No further interaction, no scamming or forced buying. Passing by this street, I arrived at a pillar that suggested. This location used to be the city limits of Chengdu during the Shu Han state of the Sun Guo Three Kingdoms period. Then we got to the outside of the Wuhou Shrine Museum complex and went to an ancient pedestrian street named Jinli, an old street with modern shops. My local friends told me a lot of merch from shops in Jinli are actually not worth buying or eating or patronizing, as the stuff sold here are overpriced and only mid quality. So in short, Jinli is kind of a tourist trap for those who don't know Chengdu well. So what I did instead was just walk around and、uh, immerse myself in the atmosphere, and grab some free samples of snacks and tea that shop assistants were giving out. Mid tasting foods taste so much better when it's free, like it literally tastes like a steal. And this one shop about Jinli that was 
especially memorable for me. It was a record shop selling vinyl disc recordings of Western classical music. They've got Sibelius, Beethoven, Forjak, etc. But I never bought anything. I mean, I don't have any old photograph or vinyl player at home that can play these huge ass discs. So we met up, all four of us, then went inside the Wuhou Shrine together. One of the local friends says he has never visited the Wuhou Shrine even though he's from Chengdu and literally grew up here. What, which, which is shocking. Anyways, what is Wuhou Shrine? It is a memorial complex containing the tomb of Liu Bei, the emperor of the Shu Han kingdom that ruled from Chengdu and was self-declared to be a continuation of the Eastern Han Dynasty. So because of the existence of Shu Han, the Han Dynasty de facto lasted from 202 BC to 263 AD, instead of the abdication of the last Eastern Han Emperor in 220 AD. But we're not at the tomb yet. First, we pass by a few halls, including the main hall containing the statue of Liu Bei. Right beside are the halls containing statues of his two blood brothers, Guan Yu and Zhang Fei. I forgot to take a picture of Zhang Fei's hall, but I did take a picture of Guan Yu's statue. After his death, Guan Yu was deified and worshipped as the god of war and god of wealth in Chinese folk religion. So it's also interesting how this hall, there is a statue of a fictional character, Zhou Cang, from the semi-fictional novel Romance of the Three Kingdoms, San Guo Yan Yi. So this novel is based on the true history of the Three Kingdoms but has many modifications, exaggerations, and even creations of new characters and stories, including Zhou Cang, whom had a statue made for and placed in Guan Yu's hall. Zhou Cang was later also worshipped as the god of the door in the religion of Taoism. In another hall that's further inside the shrine, there's a statue of the Imperial Chancellor Zhuge Liang. Throughout my journey in Chengdu, I'm gonna meet Zhuge Liang a few times Lamao. He's a very important person in the Three Kingdoms and also vital to the history and culture of Chengdu and the Sichuan region. Then we finally arrive at the tomb of Liu Bei, the Hui Mausoleum, Hui Ling. It's a huge grave with a little dirt hill and a roundabout walkway and circumference. Then this aesthetic little pond. There's this story about the tomb of Liu Bei and why it was never looted after almost two millennia. So it goes throughout the history of China because people from the countryside were poor, they would often find alternate ways to earn money that might not always be legal, including raiding the tombs of historical figures and leaders whom they believe were buried with lots of treasure. Legend has it that during the chaotic Anlu Shan rebellion of the Tang Dynasty, a few tomb thieves came to the Wuhou Shrine in Chengdu and decided to loot Liu Bei's tomb. They went inside, but to their shock, they entered a brightly lit room and saw Liu Bei and his brothers Guan Yu and Zhang Fei enjoying a game of chess while drinking alcohol and feasting on meat. The thieves were initially scared, frozen in place, when their gaze met the eyes of the Liu Bei brothers. Then Zhang Fei told them, hey, wanna join us? And poured their leader a cup of alcohol. The leader drank it and was stuttering, asking, uh, do, do you have some valuables that we can take with us? Liu Bei stood up and personally handed the thieves one jade belt each. Then he said, take these and go. After the thieves exited the tomb, the tomb was magically sealed back and they suddenly realized something wasn't right. The jade belts transformed into snakes and wrapped around their bodies, immobilizing them. And when they turned to their leader, they discovered that the alcohol he drank and turned into glue and sealed his mouth shut. The story is obviously fictional and invented by the folk of Chengdu to protect the resting place of a former emperor that they admired and respected a lot. And definitely has a few variations when told by different people. But because it got spread so widely around all of China, no tomb raider ever dared to loot Liu Bei's tomb. So Liu Bei not only won the respect of Chengdu folk and Sichuan people, but the people from all of China. After touring the Wuhou Shrine, we had lunch and passed by this very iconic style of traditional architecture, located in the foreground of some modern high-rise residential building. Next, passing by a Qing Dynasty post office branch in Chengdu, whose building is now occupied and used by the Postal Savings Bank of China. Walking down a bit more and admiring these beautiful autumn colored trees with beautiful yellow leaves on the grass, and also passing by the Sichuan Science and Technology Museum with a statue of Chairman Mao Zedong in front. 
So the current location is Tianfu Square, designed to resemble the shape of an yin yang mark or Taiji symbol, and a very pretty flower bed in the middle with the colors of the flowers planted in the shape of the immortal golden sunbird. To the west of Tianfu Square is the Chengdu Museum, which contains the history of the Ba Shu, which is Chongqing and Sichuan region, and depicts especially well the near contemporary history of Chengdu. So this here is a reconstruction of the famous Chunxi Lu from the Republic of China era, and here the liberation of Chengdu. Chengdu from nationalist forces, and this one, Chengdu from an even earlier era. There's just so many things in the museum that I didn't take pictures of, and honestly, so many museums I went to during my visit to Chengdu. So here's a pic of the four of us together, as we exited the museum and went back to the Tianfu Square. The sun had already set and the lights were on. The illuminated square looked very beautiful against the backdrop of the high-rise buildings. So I had a simple dinner by myself, cause my friends went home early, at a street side style stall, Dou Hao Chi, that sold Sichuan style deep fried chicken. So I bought exactly that, with a side of potatoes, and potatoes. Double potato. So after dinner, took a picture of this majestic disc pillar that's in the 3D version of the Immortal Golden Sunbird, which is located right outside the entrance to the metro station. So inside the metro station, it's also very huge and honestly looked like a marvelous architectural design feat. Like that's the awesome thing about metro stations in China. After the metro ride back to my hotel, I didn't immediately go back upstairs, but wandered around the streets behind a bit. It was quiet, but not dead. The streets were still alive, with many roadside food stalls selling dinner and snacks to the people who just got off work. With that, my day ended with this cute little kitty to make up for my lack of video footage. Day 4, December 17. In the morning, we visited the Du Fu Thatch Cottage, Du Fu Cao Tang. So, Du Fu was the Tang Dynasty poet and politician, and a friend of Li Bai, another famous Chinese politician and poet. So, these two guys are considered among China's greatest poets and even influence Japanese literary and poetry culture. So, going inside the complex, similar to the Wuho Shrine, it wasn't simply the thatched cottage itself, but a few temples, including one with the statue of Du Fu himself. So inside, there's also a warning sign warning us to please do not the cat. Another statue of Du Fu, this time made using stone against the backdrop of the reconstructed cottage. So going inside, this is the study room where Du Fu composed more than 240 poems in the short span of four years. Well, I, being a pianist, thought this was a piano at first. Pianos totally existed during the Tang Dynasty. Yeah. The kitchen and dining area, really simple and old. I mean, it's over 1200 years old. Outside, there's a stone carved with a very deep and interesting quote. When people mention Du Fu, they can forget his place of birth and place of death, but no one is able to forget his cottage in Chengdu. Myself included, I only found out after the visit that Du Fu was actually born in Gong County of Henan Province, known today as Gong Yi City, and died in Leiyang in Hunan Province. The original site of the cottage, however, became an archaeological site. It was uncovered relatively recently, in only 2001, by real estate developers. Who could have guessed the residence of a Chinese poet from 1200 years ago not only contributed to Chinese poetry and literature, but also the archaeological studies of China in the past. Outside, there's this pagoda and this exhibition hall inside which they had a picture of Kim Il-sung visiting the cottage. Surprised? Not really. Kim Il-sung spoke Chinese when he was young, and it was not strange for a Chinese speaker to be interested in Chinese history and poetry. So exiting the cottage museum complex, I saw many statues of Chinese historical figures, including the three Cao, Cao Zhi, Cao Cao, and Cao Pi from the late Eastern Han Dynasty and early Three Kingdom period state of Wei, the three Su, Su Shi, Su Xun, and Su Zhe, and in the center the largest statues, Du Fu, Li Bai, and Warring Kingdom's heir poet from the state of Chu, Qu Yuan. But why is Li Bai's statue in black when the Bai in his name means white? Anyways, went for lunch again. Don't be deceived by this oily and red amount of chili and pepper here. This dish actually isn't spicy. Just eat it like a Chengdu native, avoid all the chili and pepper, and dig out the meat from below the oil. Yum! After lunch, we went walking and take a look at this metro station exit. Yup, it's got the logo of the immortal golden sunbird, Taiyang Shen Niao. 
Why? Because it's located right outside the Jinsha Museum, a national archaeological park. This place is full of the sunbirds, so there will be even more later. So here is an archaeology site of the Jinsha settlement, which is an ancient pre-Central Plains culture settlement that may be linked to an even earlier culture that spanned the entire Shu region, called Sanxingdui. Close to the site is a museum where we found this mask that the iPhone camera detected as a face. <laughs> Looking down from the top floor to the bottom, there another sunbird. After viewing a few more ancient artifacts on display, we see the OG immortal golden sunbird. It's made from 94.2% purity gold, that's 22.6 carat, and it's only 0.2 millimeters thick while being 12.5 cm in diameter. That's some ancient tech that even modern Chinese technology hasn't been able to produce. Very fascinating! Also, many ancient Chinese artifacts can be accurately translated into English. So for example, this B, roughly translated as a jade disc. So some more educational information, the mortal golden sunbird ornament has become the emblem of the China cultural heritage from not only Sichuan, but all of China, including this sunbird popsicle, which was like orange or tangerine flavored. So after a visit to the Jinsha Museum, we went through a park near where my friends lived, had some tea from Cha Ji, and walked along this river all the way back to Tai Gu Li, where we went to on the first day. The sun has set already, and we decided to have some Middle Eastern cuisine for dinner after eating Sichuan food consecutively. Love your utensils brings an extra layer of Middle East to our experience, yeah? The food is great! I mean, I always had a liking for Middle Eastern food since I lived in Singapore. I would usually bring friends to Turkish restaurants back there, and I also visited UAE and had Arab cuisine. So this time, it was me recommending to these friends what to have. Look at this fire burn! <laughs> and this funny yogurt lamao. After dinner, I just walked back to my hotel, which was just one metro station away, along the road, taking in the sight of the city lights at night and across the river enjoying this beautiful night view. Ending off the day with another kitty cat. It's morning and time to head to the train station again. Today, we're leaving Chengdu from Chengdu East Railway Station, Chengdu Dongzhan, and heading to Sanxingdui Station. This station is named after the Sanxingdui culture that appeared around Chengdu and has archaeological evidence suggesting the existence of pre Central Plains era Shu culture, along with other related sites like Jinsha. And that's exactly why we're here today to visit the Sanxingdui Museum. Sanxingdui is located outside the administrative boundaries of Chengdu entirely in a neighboring city called Guanghan. So Guanghan is a county level city under the administration of Deyang, prefecture level city. Just like how Dujiangye and Jianyang are county level cities under the administration of Chengdu prefecture level city. So basically, I can say I visited more than one city during my this trip to Sichuan. Compared to Chengdu and Dujiangye, my impression of Guanghan is that this city doesn't seem as developed like my first impression, even though it's just next door. From the Sanxingdui railway station to the Sanxingdui museum, our taxi was traversing on dirt roads before finally reaching a proper road closer to the museum. Now, this to me personally doesn't feel like a good outlook, especially since China wants to advertise and develop Sanxingdui as an international tourist attraction. I guess many international tourists take a shuttle bus directly from Chengdu instead of from the Sanxingdui railway station, so maybe they won't see the dirt roads? I'm not entirely sure, but this is just a small side comment I had and doesn't impact my overall experience here. So I arrived at the Sanxingdui Museum two days too early for the Genshin Impact and Sanxingdui collab. But the museum was still majestic. Just walking into the main hall made me feel the depth, the height. Inside the first exhibition hall, the first thing that shows up is the Western Zhou-style Oracle Bone character Shu, representing the Sichuan region since thousands of years ago. It has several evolutions and variations, including this one that already closely resembles the modern character. Moving inside, some archaeological pits with artifact fragments, and this very iconic bronze mask that has many different variations, but its style is very distinct and recognizable as a representative relic of the Sanxingdui culture. They invented the pig from Angry Birds and Bad Piggies thousands of years before Rovio, 
but their birds weren't brown. They were majestic and had phoenix-shaped feathers. More little humans, big human with a missing ear, and this mysterious super tall human seeming to be holding something with their hands, or isn't holding anything specific at all. There are many theories regarding this. Sometimes the masks would be golden instead of bronze, Sometimes they would have a golden wand or stick too, and they would also have a dragon before the central Chinese dragon got popular. After exiting the first exhibition hall, I went to the gift shop and picked up a blue bird that one of my friends asked me to help check out when I visit. This double pig headband, some golden mask faces colored like superhero figures. I sat on this bird hat that can wave its wings when I press the air button below. And I brought it back to Singapore, it's here with me right now. Going to the next exhibition hall, some bronze rings that resemble the one we saw at Jinsha the day before. Here's something unable to be translated into English and called a Zun, unearthed from a sacrificial pit. Some replicas of artifacts being exhibited somewhere else. Many other untranslatable things including this Lei, also used for human sacrifice purposes. An altar base that depicts people of different sizes in the same relic. A bronze mask with protruding eyes. This tree and more trees later. And this wheel-shaped object that turned out to be an ancient depiction for the sun. Makes sense, since the sun is a star and stars are typically portrayed with five rays. And this burp is a chicken, a bigger chicken, and finally a golden money tree. Tree of wealth, basically. Then a bigger money tree, the central exhibition of the room. Then a smaller money tree, while well, it's still of value. Then some bronze bells and other stuff. There are so many other artifacts that I didn't manage to take pictures of, but as time goes on, more relics linked to the ancient Sai Xingdui culture will be unearthed and added to this museum. After touring the Sai Xingdui Museum, we took a taxi and rode along the Yazi He, Yazi River, which literally means Duck River. On this river, they realized the city, the central city area of Guanghan is quite developed actually. So that's basically a normal Chinese small town with just a little bit of dirt road in the surroundings. I'm thinking for San Xingdui to become a popular international tourist attraction, there will definitely be better looking concrete or asphalt roads built soon. Or who knows, they might even open the metro station to San Xingdui in the near future. Like metro is literally the king of interesting transport. And San Xingdui is not that far outside Chengdu. Like, my Guanghan friend even said something like, Guanghan might become part of Chengdu soon, lol. So I think it's definitely reasonable for Chengdu Metro to extend to San Xingdui or even further northeast. After my last lunch in Sichuan, yes, I'm actually ending my journey and leaving Sichuan the next day. We headed to Guanghan North Station, which really doesn't seem like a small train station. It's an important stop for trains on the Chengdu Mianyang Leshan Railway route and Xi'an Chengdu line. We just took the train back to Chengdu East Station. <laughs> In the morning when I arrived, I was in a rush to catch the train, so I didn't pay too much attention to the design of the station. But now that we returned to Chengdu and we were in no rush anymore, I simply had time to take a look outside the station and find out that it's constructed in a style pretty heavily inspired by relics from San Xingdui. Now that we're back in Chengdu, there's one last place to visit. The Manjushi Temple, Wen Shu Yuan. Those two in front with the one in the panda hat are my friends. He just bought it earlier that day. There, my friends brought me a ton of local pastries and snacks. Some are familiar to me as we eat the same stuff in the north, but with different variations and tastes. We also had a last simple dinner together. I had this little bowl of sweet served noodles, tian shui mian. It was supposed to be spicy as you can see from the red oil of the color of the pepper and chili below the sugar, but it had too much sugar so it just cancelled out the spicy taste and didn't taste spicy to me at all. My friends commented that authentic Sichuan syrup noodles didn't have this much sugar. But because Wen Shu Yuan had become such a popular tourist destination, the food places here had to adapt their food to the taste buds of tourists. Lastly, we walked through the city again and this time through Jiangren Li and bought this fermented milk drink. Also unique to Sichuan, 
and not sold anywhere outside the province. Just like the Wei Yi white vitamin drink from day one. We then parted ways and I rode the train back to my hotel, got a crispy sausage as a little snack, then wandered past the street with many piano shops again. Except it was so late that most of the shops were already closed, except one. So I just went inside, asked the shopkeepers if I can play just one song on the piano before they close for the night. They agreed, so I sat down and recorded this to complete a secret mission I had. To go to Chengdu to play this song, also named Chengdu by Zhao Lei. finish playing, but I consider that a mission accomplished, just in time for my last night in Chengdu. My trip in Chengdu has concluded, with my friend driving me to the Chuangliu airport to take my flight to Beijing, which the next episode of my vlog will be about. I had so much fun and visited so many places together with my friends in Chengdu, and I will definitely return to the city again in the future to see the many more places that I haven't visited. Chengdu, wait for me to return.